We are live. intro today, John. Let's put that fuzz on that the kid put on last weekend. You ready for that? Ready. Introduce yourself. Hi, my name's John. I'm live at the Circle R Ranch with Ken Haas. Hey! And we got some uh, semi-hollow guitars. Oh, it's semi-hollow madness. Last I checked. Oh, first, right out of the gate, let's just get this out of the way. I apologize to everybody. Uh, as you can see, uh, Jamie from Earthquaker is not here with me today. Uh, they had something come up that needed to be attended to you immediately. So we have rescheduled. Pay attention in all the usual places and you will see when that is coming up. So uh, I decided, because that's my job, uh, to talk about these uh, manta rays and roundhouses here on the live show. Um, we announced them two weeks ago today and uh, I was here with my good friend uh, Will Crudson from the Adam Ant Band, if you recall. And uh, by the way, Adam Ant's band is going to be in the States for another few weeks. And if he's coming to your town and you can do it, go. Because, man, they brought it. That band really brought it. And it felt, it, it didn't feel like, you know, a cheesy sort of 80s reunion thing. You know what I'm talking about, John? Like, it felt like you went to see a great freaking rock band because that's what they are. Uh, two guitars, bass, two drummers, 
uh, guitar players jumping on floor toms occasionally uh, to fill out like that sort of ant music kind of vibe. And um, Wicked bass player, and Adam still has it. I mean, for, I, I read that, 69 or something? Nice. I mean, goddamn. And he's just, he, he, the vocals sounded great, everything sounded great. It was a very, very entertaining show. And I think it's fun to see like a rock band sort of re, um, redo their things that suffered from 80s production, mm -hmm. right? Um, so we, we strip out the weird Tim Pennies and uh, synths and, uh, and synth generated horns and stuff and just replace all of those parts with twin electric guitars through Marshalls. <laughs> Sounds good to me. Oh, brother. Am I, am I, anyways, so enough about that. Uh, so Will and I talked about these briefly and uh, he got to play around with them here a little bit and he thought they were cool. And, uh, and then we shipped them off to uh, our good friends, Specialty Traders. And uh, Jay from Specialty Traders has been doing a great job uh, taking care of all you guys for the last couple weeks. I know that, uh, that he's been doing a thing where he's been um, you know, sending out pictures with people and, and really getting in depth um, to get these off to you guys. So we appreciate Jay uh, for helping us get these off to the public. So uh, for those of you who haven't watched my demo video on these, or if you have, and you have some questions, that's what we're doing here. Um, so, <clears throat> excuse me, I had a gig last night and I sang a little overzealously, so I'm a little hoarse this morning. Um, yeah, if you had any questions about them, uh, feel free to leave them in the comments. John is going to watch uh, as we go and I will get to all of your questions, I promise. Uh, I will sort of read, if, for those of you who haven't watched the Dumbo video on these particular guitars, um, I will tell the story and, uh, and, and tell you why they're special. So, uh, a few years ago, we had this uh, thing, um, pandemic, right? And uh, it pretty much fucked up everything. I don't know if you guys remember that or not. I know that was a hard F, F bomb, but I mean, why not, right? One of the things that happened in that time period was... Um, so as you know, I've talked about them a million times. Uh, we use a factory in South Korea, South Korea called Mir Music, um, north of Seoul. They build all of the Reverend production. We've been working with Mir on necks and pickups now for close to 24 years. And they have been doing the entire uh, builds for 20 years, going on 20 years now, that's crazy. Uh, they do an amazing job at reproducing our uh, Nailer's vision, right? And it's kind of great because they've been building a lot of our model line for so long that when it comes to things like chargers and jet streams and stuff, we can evolve those guitars because we've established a really solid baseline with the people at Mir. And Mir is an interesting animal. They, uh, everything is done by hand and everything is done on pin routers. Um, it, it is a very old school style of manufacturing uh, that we've grown quite accustomed to here. Um, so, what we discovered, I mean, we knew, but what happened during the pandemic was um, our friends at Mir lost the ability to make the Pete Anderson hollow body with the arch top. Now, they make solid body guitars at Mir, and they make the older Manta Ray guitar, um, was actually a solid body, that was chambered out from the top with the pin routers. And then maple or spruce or whatever we were doing with that, those body styles at any given time um, was put on the top. And we went forward with it like that. And what we never did was we never did sort of an arch top finish. So when it came time to do the Pete Anderson hollow body, um, they did not do you know, solid or laminated arch tops or laminated sides around the bodies. It takes special equipment and Mir specializes in building solid body guitars. So they had a smaller builder in Korea uh, building the bodies for them. And then they would put our necks and our electronics and paint them and finish the build. And that's how uh, the PA ones were being done. This small shop that was building those bodies closed during the pandemic. And it left us in a pickle on the Pete Anderson model 
uh, that we're still suffering with right now at the moment, um, which is why you don't see the PA1 on the website anymore. It's not that it's gone forever, but it is gone for now. So this sparked a bunch of interesting conversations with us. Uh, we were, for a couple of years, we were just trying to hang on and um, get the guitars out as fast as possible. Uh, because yeah, as you guys know, the industry had a huge, huge boom around that, er around that time. So all that being said, we, um, we couldn't travel. Uh, we were trying to solve the problem, but we really couldn't in our limited capacity. Uh, so for a couple of years, we just sort of accepted the lack of PA1s. In 2022, uh, Penny and I and Joe Naylor and Joe's uh, lovely wife, Kristen, who founded the company with Joe back in 97, and, and Kristen worked for Reverend for many, many years. Um, the four of us went to Korea uh, in 2022 to try to interview a couple of different factories to look at not only sort of increasing production, um, but trying to get these PA1s made. And we had a couple of leads. The whole Korea trip is a, is a story of an, in its own, which is hilarious. Um, but where we ended up was at, at a beautiful factory in Incheon called SPG. And sound performance guitar, sound precision guitar. Uh, I'm, I'm really bad at names. Sorry, uh, John, right? Anyway, so they had made, uh, for many years, they made Gretsch's and um, they, they had a bunch of, whoa, I am taking that coaster with me. Did you see that? It was magic. You know what? Shit like that didn't happen before the eclipse. Just saying. So, <laughs> SPD. Uh, they made Gretsch hollow bodies for a long time. So if you have like a 20, 25 year old um, Gretsch that says made in Korea it, it was made in this place. And they did beautiful work. I mean, you could eat off the floor anywhere in this building. It was, it was spectacular. And at the time we visited them, they were making uh, guilds and all of the guild hollow body stuff. So the X-175s, when we walked in, there were about 15 of them lined up on a guitar rack and they were just absolutely stunning. Um, they were also making uh, those Vox guitars that have the, the proprietary pickups that Vox was marketing. Uh, for, for a while, the, the, the sort of the higher end Vox models, um, a lot of Hofner Beetle basses in there. Um, I don't know what that means, but I hear people say that Beetle bass. Uh, and I, the work looked spectacular, and we were really excited to meet these people, and they really wanted to do some stuff with us. So Joe um, put together a handful of designs, including not, not just the PA1 and another model that we were working on but also a redesigned manta ray and a roundhouse semi-hollow, which I am holding in my hands. Um, these guitars were a little innovative and a little different than what came before them. Uh, the manta ray in its first rendition uh, had sort of, uh, the horns were closer to being equidistant, if not totally equidistant, and the top was flat, it was not an arch top. And, uh, Joe and I, of course, have been looking at the Reeves Cabral Space Hawk for a long time and thinking about how cool that was. And uh, Joe, sort of in the back of his mind, always wanted to do this. And when we found the place that could do it right, he was very excited to do an offset waist manta ray and um, arch the top. This has a solid maple top, it's, but it's an arch top. So it's a more traditional semi-hollow style guitar. And uh, he went with the uh, 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 Eastern mahogany back, and of course the maple top, which the natural thing shows off uh, beautifully. And then we put all the reverend appointments on it, master, uh, master tone, master volume, and the bass contour, um, reverend's vintage Alnico humbuckers, because those are also made in, in Korea right down the street from our friends at Mir, and so they source the humbuckers at the same spot, our locking tuners and input jack and all that fun stuff. And um, it is a slightly different animal than the original Manta Ray. Uh, interestingly, and we've heard this, we have a, of course we have a, we have an artist that sort of riffed on the Manta Ray for his signature model. And he always told us that that was the best sounding like 
LP style guitar that he ever played um, because it really did sound like uh, a really good solid body with a little extra air, a little extra oomph, you know? Um, this sounds more like the classic semi hollows of ore. You know, you get into the, uh, or is that a word? Of like boat ore? What am I, what was I saying there, John? Does anybody even I think know? you mean your. Your? Yeah. Is that what I meant? Of your. The classic, I don't know what you meant. No, but. classic semi hollows of your. Yeah. I like that. I'm going to go with that. Um, <laughs> They still have great sustain because we have the center block thing going. Very, very balanced across all the strings when cording. Um, and it allows you to like go from, you know, real chimey stuff. Uh, jazzy stuff. Twangier rockabilly and rock stuff, and it takes gain really, really super well. I mean, even the, um, you know, every my favorite. I don't know if it's everybody's favorite, but it sure is my favorite, the Angry Charlie. <laughs> that man ray and then similarly mr naylor had an idea for a roundhouse version of this and so this is just it sounds a little bit tighter you know and a little bit more controlled as you would expect with the smaller body these things weigh like what six and a half pounds i mean it's crazy. And they emulate uh, all the tones of the Manta Ray just in a smaller package. It's hard to describe, but playing them back to back, and it, it seems so obvious, but sometimes the obvious thing is, is the answer. The Manta Ray just seems to have a little bit more air. It seems to have a little bit more openness because you have more body vibrating, right? So of the two, the Manta Ray is a little bit more resonant. Um, but the Roundhouse has its own vibe. Like you still have that initial attack of a smaller solid body, but you're getting just a little bit of that sort of ringiness and chiminess that comes from having a semi-hollow guitar. Uh, the attack isn't as sharp as it is on the solid body roundhouse. There's like a, um, there's an upper mid-range thing that happens with the maple top in a solid body that that loses a little bit of a def, of its definition when you go into the semi-hollow. So you end up with something that um, that is a little bit more resonant, but the initial attack isn't as fast. And it just sounds, it sounds great for like strumming stuff. Both pickups off, uh, both pickups off. Sounds amazing with both pickups off, John Zenz. Uh, with both pickups on and the bass contour out a little bit. I mean. And then if you want to get into the neck pickup and and, bait, and take the uh, treble out a little bit, you can get into. Of course, the question, will it rock?
Sounds like a yes. We're not super loud, but we're not super quiet either, you know, and it's, and it, it's completely controllable. I mean, I can put more game than that on it. Uh, watch your ears, everybody. Here comes the Rev G3. And I mean, even still, with a little more trebly uh, and a little more fizzy kind of game, we're not feeding back or squealing. Man, I can dig it. So, uh, same construction, Eastern Mahogany, uh, carbon maple top, just smaller body based on our roundhouse platform. Really, really lightweight, really comfortable. The manta rays are really lightweight too. I, it, these things, they knocked them out of the park. So, here is why this is a limited edition model. So here, here's the, 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 the punchline, I guess. We, um, we had our friends at SPG make us prototypes of these guitars in a handful of colors. Natural was one of them and was our absolute favorite when we got them in. We got a prototype of, the new, of a new Pete Anderson too, a PA1 with some interesting new cosmetics and things. Um, and the Pete was going to require some changes. There was, there was some very, I'd be, I, I give you guys too much information, you know that, and, but whatever, it's fine. I, I just don't, I don't think, I think this industry has gotten a little goofy with, with, uh, with big secrets and mystique and stuff like that. And it's not like I want to peel all that back for you, but I don't have any problems with being honest with you guys either. Um, the Anderson model, this curve, uh, the curve in the lower cut, in the lower bout was just not right. It wasn't sexy enough. Um, it ended a little short and it, it was just slightly different from the original PA1 and not, Joe and I were not happy with it um, to the point where we never even sent one to Pete. Um, I have it here, I have a prototype of it here. So we knew we needed to correct the body shape on the PA1, but these two models were ready to go. And so we were putting together uh, the, the PA1 corrections and getting ready to order a second round of prototypes of those and then figuring out what we were gonna order in these. And then we got an email from SPG saying that they were going out of business. And it's a real, it's a pisser. Um, they were doing, a, Guild was the vast majority of their business. I don't know how much stuff they were doing with, with uh, the other companies, because none of that's my business, I guess. But I know that they were building a lot of guilds, and Yamaha bought Guild, and <clears throat> initially kept some of the construction there. But when you have a, a giant company that builds their own guitars, like that and the and Yamaha has factories everywhere. Um, I think the writing was kind of on the wall that they were gonna lose that business and then they did. Um, and so we got the call and I, I don't know, again, I don't know what all was going on internally there, but I've heard that um, the lease was up on their building, which was beautiful and they were in a position where they had to renew for like, you know, five years, 10 years or whatever and they were, unsure <coughs> about their business plan going forward. So they just pulled the plug on us. <coughs> Excuse me, everybody. Like I said, I sang a little hard last night. So they're gone. Uh, and they were like, we're going to do this until the end of the year. This was the end of the summer last summer. And I talked about it with Joe. And we decided to take a huge leap of faith and order uh, 50 of these, uh, 25 of each. I actually ordered 28 of each. Um, but we sold 25 of each and I kept a few back. Um, I've done a couple of artist deals uh, because I think that we'll see this platform um, come back around. Um, and uh, also for prototyping for future development. I mean, we, we are actively having um, these builds made for us at a few other places that build a lot of guitars from major brands. So we're gonna see how that, um, how that pans out. And hopefully down the road, we will see these again. And if the question is gonna be when and are you gonna do a black one, boy, that would look great in burst. I love all that and, and I, yes, they would. I think that this platform opens itself up to all kinds of stuff. I saved for myself, big surprise, a periwinkle one of these from the original round of prototypes that I just think is awesome looking, but I'm weird. Um, so, 
I don't know when, but I do know that it will happen. But it, you know, it could take a couple of years um, before we really dive into it. Uh, we are very, very fortunate to have a retailer um, that that is so invested in us and our brand like Specialty Traders. Uh, we're very fortunate to have somebody like them that was willing to just said, you know, we talked about it with a few people and he was the first guy that went like, no, 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 can, can I take them all? And we were like, that's bold. That's, that's a bold statement. It's a bold decision. Um, and so that's, that's where they are. They're, out, they're all at Specialty Traders. I'm pretty sure he has a reverb listings up. Um, you can find them over there. Uh, we've been really pleased with them so far. Uh, they, they have a few <clears throat> anomalies, um, but, uh, but honestly, they came over set up, I think, better. John, John will attest to this. I mean, the, the actual factory setup is, They're really good. was unbelievable. Like, as far as being playable out of the box, even getting to us, you know, um, we did, I think we swapped a couple of nuts because a couple of things were a little low for, for what green prefers, you know? Um, so we, we definitely did a few tweaks on a few of them, but um, getting them through the shop was, was pretty, pretty easy and self-explanatory and, and, and uh, actually kind of a lot of fun to have something new and different here and exciting. So there, I've said my piece. That would be the uh, Manta Ray and the Roundhouse Semi-Hollows. <clears throat> I am going to open myself up for some questions. Here we go, John. Do they have questions for me? Oh, we got some questions. Oh, I love questions. Make sure my mic's on. <clears throat> I, I am sorry for the uh, horse <coughs> yeah, and the little, little coffin thing I'm doing. I feel great. Uh, not an issue, but I did yell and holler last night. I don't know if I told you guys, and I don't know if anybody is watching that was around last night or whatever, but, man, the Zimmerman Twins drummer just kicked miles of ass and took some names last night. We had a hell of a good show. A lot of fun. So that's why I'm hoarse. Can you dig it? I can dig it. Uh, on the screen right now, for the people at home, Zach Ward's got the link to find them at Specialty Traders. Oh, cool. Thanks, Zach. Good good, good call, bud. Appreciate that. Awesome. Uh, what do we got here? Popo. Popo! I'd like to know why mahogany, not white limba slash Karina. Um, Joe wanted to go a little more traditional route with this guitar. Um, he wanted to set it apart from the manta rays that we were doing before in, in the white limba, in the Karina, and get that throatier... Uh, lower mid enhancement that your ears are used to hearing when you're playing this style of guitar. Um, with the brightness associated with the carved maple top, the upper mid range that comes along with using Karina, Joe felt would cause some weirdness. So hence, we went with the mahogany. Good question. Because we are the Karina company, I know. I got you. Trying to find, you covered a lot of these Good, questions. Good, I'm glad. Look at me. Look at me. Uh, this kind of was covered, but kind of not. Christopher Lee Michael, will more non-exclusive and less expensive editions be manufactured in the future? That, I don't know. I mean, we're, we are, we're definitely working on it. We, uh, we want to, we obviously want to go forward with this. <laughs> it's so cool looking. Um, but where that is going to happen and in what form i don't have an idea yet but i'll definitely be keeping you guys posted um as it starts to come together i'll let you know but like i said it could take a couple of years honestly um it's crazy out there and we're doing our best <clears throat> uh, da, 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 da. sorry no it's totally fine the good news is that we made enough of them you know, that they should last for a little bit. It, it's a niche thing for, for Reverend, you know. Um, but I, I think it's very, very cool. And in this format, they won't be replicated, which is why we numbered all the ones that we sold to specialty traders and we included the little uh, certificates. I remember signing all the certificates that have uh, which number it is of the run and all of those sort of things. Um, it, we sort of made it a whole package with the teardrops while we're still uh, going really heavy into the teardrop hard cases because I think rumors are flying that we're going to be doing some, some soft shell cases here eventually, and those rumors are true, uh, but we are going to keep the hard 
hard shells around, and so we made it a whole package with the hard shell case and the uh, and the, the paperwork and the whole nine yards. So yes. Uh, Jay Ergo. Hey Jay, how you doing, bud? Good, good. Important question: Is the roundhouse neck heavy? That is an important question. I like that question. Um, boy, no, really, it's not. Uh, Joe thinks about these things, right? As we all know, right? We've talked about this a number of times. So the, the upper bout sort of protrudes out far enough that it balances very, very well on a strap. So if I'm just holding it by the end pin, which I can't do for very long, as you can see from the end pin, it is certainly not neck diving. Um, if you hold it in the lower bout, yeah, you can feel it start to go a little bit. Um, but the body weighs just enough. I mean, if the body was a pound less, it would be incredibly neck heavy. But where they're coming in in that sort of upper six, uh, right around seven pound range, uh, mid to upper sixes, there doesn't appear to be an issue with it. It's funny, uh, that is a really good question. I guess the honest answer to that is, I've been playing around with these things now for a few weeks, and it's never occurred to me that they are. So to me, the answer is no. Good question. Uh, Jim, who knows, again. wonders what car is that? Oh, oh, oh. talking about my baby. Uh, that is a car viceroy. And uh, the deal with, with that particular one, it's so cool. Um, that one is actually branded the Vincent. And he let me borrow that amp the year he launched it for our NAM booth, which we're going back to 2010, 11, 12, somewhere back in there. And um, before he even went into production, Gretsch told him he couldn't call it the Vincent. And he changed the name of the model to the Viceroy. And I had it in my possession when he did the name change. And Steve called me and was like, hey, I can't really do anything with that. So if you have a use for it, I'll give you a screaming deal. And uh, I have played the shit out of that guitar for the last 12, or amp for the last 12 or 13 years. I've used it on numerous feeds. Now, I got a Rambler recently. And so it's usually a Rambler recently, five, six years ago. Uh, I use the Rambler a lot in the demo videos and stuff. This particular uh, amp, this vice where I hear, goes out with me a lot to Polka Floyd gigs, where I'm running two amps in a smaller room, and I run my big 88 watt, two, this is more information than you asked for, my uh, 88 watt 212 stays clean, louder, and I run that bad boy at seven watts loud, and when I am playing leads, I, I sustain into feedback like instantly on that amp. It's so, when I run it at low wattage hot, it's so awesome. It's a really, really fun amp, but it has a gorgeous clean tone. I mean, unrivaled. I wish I knew some clean songs for you. Pig Floyd on the brain this week. Speaking of clean tones, Chris Van Sickle wants to know what fuzz you were using in the beginning. <laughs> See what I did there? Check it out. This is uh, this is this guitar clean. This is uh, Ibanez Tube Screamer 30th anniversary. And then I like to throw the Wonder Red Rider on top of the Tube Screamer after the Tube Screamer in the signal chain. 
That's, that's a sound. Uh, the Red Rider by itself is awesome. But I like putting a little bit of a milder sort of overdrive in front of a fuzz. I think it, it creates magic. Can you dig it, John? I dig it. He can dig it. Blues Hawk 56. I like that, Blues Hawk 56. Little off topic, but will the standard okay. Reverend case fit a flat rock with a Bigsby? Yes, it absolutely will. Uh, when you get on the top of the hard shell cases, um, there is a foam pad that comes down off the top of the case, maybe about a half an inch to five eighths of an inch or so, um, that rests along the top of that. And the first for the first long while that you use, you put a Bigsby equipped guitar in the standard teardrop. If you just close the lid on the case, it'll stop maybe about three-eighths of an inch shy of closing all the way. And you do have to push it down and close the latches. And you're just compressing that foam around the Bigsby Bridge um, until that foam sort of fo forms around the Bigsby Bridge. It doesn't hurt anything. It's totally fine um, for, for you to do that. And we've had people that have been carrying Bigsby equipped guitars around in those cases for 27 years. Right, since the first, since the Revsby's in uh, 1998 or whatever, uh, absolutely no problem, won't hurt it. Uh, uh, uh. Same with this, this in the large case. Uh, the large case, that foam that's on the top of the lid in the large case will form around this bridge um, and, and eventually uh, you won't have to do that and it'll hold it nice and tight and secure, so. And then of course, while we're talking about those cases, those little foam blocks, uh, we put in everything really with some of the body styles like the Jetstream, it's completely unnecessary, uh, but with the because we use the same case for the Jetstream and the Charger, and the upper horn is different on both of those models uh, with Charger bodies or East Siders or something, if you just put that foam block here, um, it's fine. Uh, you don't necessarily need the foam block for the Manta Ray in the large case either, but we include them in everything because it's just easier to have them in there. So there you have it. The uh, loose foam block is not a mistake. <laughs> uh, you kind of mentioned something about this earlier, but Scott Busey would like to know, does Mir make our rail hammers? Um, I'll answer that. Um, there is a company in Korea called Wave Products. It's a very, very, it's a small family owned factory, husband and wife team working on the floor. Um, I'm not, I'm never one of those people that can like look at a building and be like, oh, that's this many square feet. Um, but I mean, it's small. Um, five or six employees and all they do is build pickups. And they make all of the Reverend pickups. They make all the Town the Co and Sound the Co and the HA5s and the all the, all the P90 stuff, all of the rail hammers, they do it all there. Uh, they do the, 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 the laser etching process there. Uh, they wax pot them all. Um, we were there, la when we were there a couple summers ago, um, the, the owner, Mr. Mr. Koo, uh, his, his wife was doing final assembly stuff. They were, they were an absolute joy uh, to spend an afternoon with. It was very, very cool. I have video. And I have shared video on my social media of, um, of a bunch of the Reverend pickups being wound and manufactured. Uh, I will share that stuff again, man, because uh, that was cool. I'll tag you in it when I do. Maybe I'll share that. I'll go through my photo roll and find some of those pictures and share them over the weekend, because beautiful, beautiful place. They are very, very close to Mir um, in northern South Korea. They're very close to the, uh, the DMZ, believe it or not. It's pretty wild. and. Um, and yeah, really, really cool, interesting place. They work very, very closely with Mir. They've, um, they have been sharing manufacturing, they've been manufacturing pickups for the uh, brands that Mir manufactures for for many, many years. So I think the two companies are very symbiotic. Um, and when we, uh, when we started doing these guitars with SPG, we made that connection between the two of them so that 
uh, the pickups that are being made, Wave products went into these guitars as well, uh, seamlessly with absolutely no issues. So again, probably more information than you need, but honestly, this stuff, like it all interests me, pulling all of this together. It's really cool to be like, I don't know, to be a part of this sort of global manufacturing thing and meet people from around the world that take a lot of pride in what they do. And, and it's fun to, you know, not just, I don't know, it's so stupid and it sounds overly political and I don't mean it to be, but I mean, it's fun to, you know, create jobs here and create jobs there and then have create jobs for our dealers in the UK and in the EU and, and everywhere these guitars are sold. It's just a fun, it's a fun thing to be a part of from beginning to end to, to, to watch from where I am and like sort of coordinate things being made to things being perfected to, to then to things being sold at retailers and going and seeing, you know, the end product with, which is, you know, you being excited about what we do. It's rad. I'm just, it's a beautiful job. Got like one more here for you. And John is like, oh my God, stop talking. Wrap it up. Wrap uh, it up. <laughs> Jack American Dreamer, who joins us from Italy. Oh, cool, man. How you doing, Jack? Awesome. Just wants to know what delay you're using live. Right now, nothing. Um, but when I play in my silly bands, um, one of the things that I have in front of me here is a uh, carbon copy. And it is set to sort of regen a little bit because I wasn't messing with it, but let's uh, get this right. I love this fast slapback for when I'm doing that sort of uh, polka shuffle thing or even the reggae thing. If you guys saw the Jay Navarro and the Traders videos, when I'm doing that, I love to have a little bit of slapback and then I do a lot of single note. I love that sort of palm muted slapback delay tone. I think that's a lot of fun. When I'm doing the Polka Floyd thing, believe it or not, I have a, what is it, 2024? Sure is. I have a 25 or 26 year old Line 6 DL4 that still works. I've been using These it in the Polka Floyd show for 20 years, and our drummer in Polka Floyd is such an animal that I barely even have to temp to a tap. I have three settings in it. I have a long tail thing for echoes. I have the crazy sort of shorter thing for run like hell or whatever. Um, the, yeah, those things are tanks. Why are those things tanks? I don't, they, they messed up. They should have made them bad. They could have sold a lot more. Yeah, honestly, uh, I, I got to quit talking. People have been asking me about that. Like, is that an original one? Yeah, and I keep talking about it. I'm like willing it to break by talking about <laughs> it so much, <laughs> which is not what I want to happen. Cool. All right. Well, listen, everybody, thanks for uh, tuning in today. I appreciate you. I appreciate that you tune into this uh, show because I, I think it's really, really cool. It's one of the things that sort of keeps me in touch with all of you guys. And I'm really, really super into that. And thanks for all the, the follows and the likes on all the socials, whether it's the Reverend pages or my own personal one. Appreciate you guys. Um, and uh, a couple of announcements. Well, I'm going to make, well, I, I have some pretty, I have some actually really cool shit going on over the next month or so. First is, uh, next weekend, I will not be here <coughs> for next Friday's show because I am going to uh, Ben Salem, Ben Salem, Ben Salem? North of Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, uh, for the This Is Not Croydon Festival, uh, which is a huge ska fest that goes over three days. I think I have six reverend endorsers uh, playing on the bill, including myself. Uh, Jane Navarro and the Traders are playing Saturday evening. Uh, Suicide Machines are playing Saturday night. Uh, toasters are playing. I don't remember. We are the, we are the unions going to be there. There's going to be a lot of reverence at this show. And as I've been known to do at some of these Scott festivals when I have so many bands on, I, I'm going to go work the merch area. I have 12 guitars getting set up, ready to go. Uh, actually, eight guitars and four basses. And uh, I'm going to display them at the festival next weekend so that people see them on stage if they want to come put their hands on them. Heck, I got to be there anyway, right? Might as well show off the guitars and such. 
And then the following week, this is amazing. This all just came together for us yesterday. Two weeks from today at 11 in the morning, <clears throat> Rick Vito is going to be here on the couch. And I'm going to be interviewing Rick about his career and about the three, uh, three count them, three signature models that we have done with Rick over the years. Uh, I have examples of most of them, I believe. I know I have my original. Uh, I have a prototype of the, the Soul Shaker. And of course, we have the new Soul Agent, which is sort of the culmination of all of it. Uh, Rick has a brand new record out called uh, Cadillac Man. And uh, we are going to discuss that and his career and all things Rick Vito, which is amazing. It, uh, Rick's second trip to the Circle Eye Ranch, but the first trip to this studio. And he is going to be doing uh, some live videos for the Live at the Circle Eye Ranch series with some very special musicians. And so we have that to look forward to in the future. I'm very excited about it. And then, I, not to give away who those musicians are, but... The night before Rick is here, uh, the Cock Marshall Trio is playing at the Village Idiot in Maumee, Ohio. Hmm, how weird. Uh, so that's all exciting. And then the weekend after that, so three weeks from today, Miss Penny and I will be coming to you live from the Dallas International Guitar Festival, which is one of the, if not my favorite, guitar event of the year. It is fantastic. And uh, Jimmy Wallace, the promoter of that show, does a great job. Reverend is sponsoring the Texas 10 Under 20. Uh, the winner is going to get a brand new Reverend guitar. We are also sponsoring the clinician stage in the building, which Greg and I will be appearing on, I believe, at 2 in the afternoon on both Saturday and Sunday. There are so many live performances. There. So Greg is going to be playing with the masters of the Telecaster with, uh, with Red Volkart and all the tele legends that go uh, down there every year, and uh, it's going to be a hell of a show. So that is the first weekend in May. So look at all this cool stuff we have looking forward to. And then we're just getting started because uh, May itself, all the bands that we have coming in to do the Circle R sessions, it's unbelievable. Uh, and uh, we're getting another one of our signature artists in here next month. I'm very excited about that. So thanks, everybody, for tuning in and pay attention because there is so much more to come. Let's rock. that rock? Well, it can be with that fuzz pedal as we discussed. 